Welcome to the Osage United Methodist Church on this Sunday morning. I'm glad you could join us and we uh, hope you uh, have time to sit down and uh, have your coffee and, and join us for this worship service. Open your hearts to God's loving mercy. Lord, come into our hearts this day. Having received God's mercy, bring that love to others. Lord, be with us as we reach out to others in compassion. Feel our spirit filled with the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings which you pour into our lives. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, who lifts us up, resides in our hearts today, help us to listen closely to your words to us. Remind us that you are always with us throughout all of our lives. Give us confidence in your presence so that we may go into your world ready to witness to your love through our works and our deeds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 30. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor, for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I am still that I still have. Here ends the reading. from Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. 
For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After greeting with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. And I am not allowed to do what I choose with, with what belongs to me. Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Here ends the reading. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh, gracious and loving God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One day, a rich young ruler came enthusiastically running up to Jesus and asked, What must I do to be saved? Jesus answered, Keep the law. This I have done from my youth, the, the man replied. Yet one thing do you lack, says Jesus. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Then come follow me. We were told that the young man walked away sorrowfully. He had great wealth. And, Jesus, and the master says, it, was, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples had been watching, this, watching the dynamics of this happening, and they were quite disturbed. Jewish tradition had always taught that God especially blessed rich men, and that is why he was rich. In their way of thinking, if a wealthy man could not receive salvation, then how could a poor man have any hope? They asked, they asked of Jesus, who then uh, can be asked Jesus, who can be saved? It reminds me of the movie Fiddler on the Roof, the poor Jewish milkman who lives in the early 1900 Russia sings what he what would he do if he were a rich man his wife reminds him money is a curse and he immediately uh, shouts up to heaven curse me God curse me Jesus had just turned away a wealthy man and in the Jewish way of thinking it didn't make any sense in fact I'm not sure how many preachers would have the courage to do it but it was Simon Peter who drew the question even clearly, uh, more clearly into focus for us. He asked what was on the mind of every one of us. Only we're not all that courageous to, to even admit that we even want to say it or think it. And Peter didn't have any problem with that at all. He simply laid his cards out on the table. He said, Lord, we have given everything, riches and all, to follow you. What then shall we have? In other words, what is in it for us, Lord? How do we stand to profit? Where's the payoff? And in response to Peter's question, Jesus told the story. It was harvest time, and it was harvest time of the year. At 7 a.m., a wealthy landowner went to town, to the town square to hire laborers. And about noon, he came back into the town and hired some more, some more. And towards the end of the day, there was still a need for more men. Perhaps this was a harvest of grapes that had to be brought in before the rains began. So at 5 p.m., the, land, the landowner went back into the town, hired some more laborers. At sunset, all the men lined up to be paid. When they got their envelopes, lo and behold, all of them had been paid the same amount. 
The man who had worked 11 hours had been paid the same as a man who had worked one hour. This enraged all the day workers. But the landlord replied, do you grudge me my, my generosity? Am I not allowed to do what I please with what belongs to me? The laborers are interested in measuring their success economically. They, they feel that a longer work day should be, yield a greater economic reward. This is the model most of us understand in our workplace as well. Full-time employees um, earn proportionally more than part-time employees. The understanding is that uh, although part-time employees work just as hard as full-time employees, full-time employees put in more hours and therefore deserve more pay. Few would argue with the, this economic logic. I am sure that this parable of Jesus must have fallen like a big thud upon the ears of its listeners. Here Simon Peter had asked Jesus a serious question and in reply he gets a story that on the surface sounds quite ludicrous. A landowner that pays equal wages for men who, who do not work equal hours? Why? That's not an American way. That's not, that that r runs counter to our whole system of justice and fair play. Who would work all day if you could simply wait till the last hour and then collect all day's pay? The fact is that deep within us, we have a kind of, of, of uh, sympathy for those uh, grumbling laborers. The story that Jesus uh, told turns our whole economic system upside down. Simon must have been particularly offended by the story because it's obvious he identifies, identifies with it. He sees himself as the laborer who has chosen early in the morning and worked all day. He doesn't comprehend why others should have preferential treatment. Now, don't you get Simon's don't you get Simon Peter uh, has been wronged? He, he's not opposed to, to uh, uh, favors being dispensed. He simply believes that if anyone should receive them, it should be those who work in the fields all day, just like himself. By telling his story, Jesus is informing Simon Peter that he will get no more reward from discipleship than anyone else. The person who comes late is just as important as the one who comes early. What if the wage in our parable, though, is grace? If grace meets you where you are and makes you whole, will you complain that some people were made whole thanks to more grace than you received? Or will you be grateful to be made whole and see others made whole, lacking nothing and living into the beauty of being God's beloved child? An economic model doesn't work when we are discussing grace. In fact, that just doesn't seem fair to us. It goes against the um, business mentality that, that dominates our lives. We have always been taught you only get out of something directly in proportion to which you put into it. Yes, that is not what happened in Jesus' story. In our way of thinking, the laborers who came to the field late got something for nothing. This parable challenges us not to look upon the kingdom of God or the church as a business community. Yet that is um, difficult for us to do because that is our point of reference. We protest as loudly as Simon Peter is protesting to Jesus. You see, we live in a world of tenure and seniority, and it goes against our grain when we hear Jesus say, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Certainly, this was foreign to the Jew Jewish mentality and for, and for they were God's chosen people. They were the laborers who had been in the field, worked hard all day long. Of course, a real problem, and in turn our problem, is that we really do not comprehend the nature of God's unmerited grace. We sing songs like Amazing Grace, but the truth is that we usually are uncomfortable with last-minute deathbed conversions. We feel that those people have, gone, have gotten the best of both worlds. It doesn't seem fair. Dr. William Power, professor at Southern Methodist University, describes an experience he had in a Sunday school when he was a boy. His teacher was trying to explain to him and his rowdy friends the meaning of grace. But she wasn't getting very far. She wasn't getting across to them. She, was, she was, uh, uh, tried definitions and abstractions to no avail. Finally, she realized something the boys had known from the start. 
she was not connecting. She was not getting through to them. She didn't have the foggiest notion. They didn't have the foggiest notion of what she was talking about. So she took a deep breath and tried again. She said, look, boys, grace is the break you get when you don't deserve it. That's the simple explanation. But you won't really understand it until you experience it. But God's grace is not based upon what is fair, but rather what helps. It wasn't fair that the laborers who worked only an hour received a full day's wage, but look who they were. All day they had been in the town square and no one chose them for employment. They were the reject rejects. The, the landowner asked them, why are you standing idle? Their response, because no one has hired us. They were the rejects, the bottom of the barrel. So now go back to the beginning of the parable and reread what the landowner said to those he hired in the beginning of the day. He said, I will pay you what is right. What he paid those last workers who were in the fields only one hour was not correct based upon the minimum hourly scale, but it was right because of the des desperateness of their condition. God's grace isn't based on fairness. It's based upon what is right and what helps. If there is any special payoff or being selected early in the, the labor and, uh, in the Lord's field, it's simply the inner satisfaction that we receive from being in God's employ, employment. But we are so much like those, those all-day laborers. Notice how they, they worded it. We carry the burden in the heat of the day. Isn't that the precisely so often how we look upon service in the church, not as a joy, not as a privilege, but a burden to carry in the heat of the day? Clearly, when Simon Peter asked Jesus what they were to receive from the kingdom, he had in mind something a little bit more substantial than inner satisfaction. But we still don't think that the whole thing is fair, and, and by our standards, it certainly isn't. You see, we live in a world tallies and accounts of debts and owed and debts paid. We live in a world of boundaries and schedules and spreadsheets and bookkeeping and hourly wages. The kingdom of God is on another dimension, one that turns our world upside down. The economics of the kingdom of God are quite unlike the economics of the world. And like Simon Peter, we bitterly complain about the unfairness of it all. We uh, miss the point that if God had our, our tally book mentality and, and were strictly, went strictly by what is fair, the salvation would be out of grasp for all of us. The issue is not what is fair. The issue is, how can we bring more into the fields to serve? Why? In the words of Jesus, because the harvest is great and the labors are for you. After serving as a missionary for 40 years in Africa, Henry C. Morris became sick and had to return to America. As the great ocean liner docked in New York Harbor, there was a great crowd gathered to welcome home another passenger on the boat. Morris watched as President Teddy Roosevelt received a grand welcome home party after his African safari. Resentment seized Henry Morris, Morrison, and he turned to God in anger and said, I have come back home all this time and of this time and service to the church, and there is no one, not even one person here to welcome me home. And a still small voice came to Morrison and said, You are not home yet. We have a reward coming. We have a reward coming, but, but not in, in this world. You see, the economics of the kingdom of God are different than the economics of the world. You see, we are not home yet. We are not home yet. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, you bless, your blessings abound in our lives, and we lift our voices in gratitude for these loving gifts that you, you give to us. We also lift our voices as our hearts cry out, our concerns for those who are ill, those who mourn, those who feel lost. We offer to you both our joys and our concerns, so often mingled together in our lives. Be with each of us and for those whom we name now in our hearts and our voices at home. And we take this time to share um, and lift them up.
Lord, you have heard our cries and our shouts of joy. Make your presence known to us again through the love and forgiveness of others as we have loved and forgiven them. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son and our Savior, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go forth in God's world as God's own children. Let the love of Christ be reflected in your life and in your deeds. Go with joy and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>